Today we're talking about domestic politics. Something that's gotten so messed up recently, we're resorting to the we'll try turning it off and then turning it back on again method of problem solving. More specifically, Democrats, a party that's held a semblance of power for maybe five minutes and cue the infighting. Specifically, a conflict over house budgeting, pitting progressive progressives like, well, my representative, and yes, my social media is so full of videos of her dancing that I'm sure someone's going on a government watch list. Honestly, Fox News, it's getting a little creepy. Here's where she went to high school. Here's her dancing. Oh no, I accidentally liked the vacation photo of her from five years ago. What do I do? Well, it's pitting her against more traditional liberal candidates like our current Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. Speaker Pelosi is trying to resurrect PAYGO, a restriction on congressional spending that was all the rage in the 90s. You know, a time when Congress actually made a profit. Today I'm going to talk about the history of PAYGO, the pros and cons of PAYGO, and the future of PAYGO legislation. So let's start with the past. In 1990, President George H.W. Bush passed the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1990 saying, When you get a bill, that bill must be paid. And when you write a check, you're supposed to have money in the bank. But if you don't obey these simple rules of common sense, there's a price to pay. But for too long, the nation's business in Washington has been conducted as if these basic rules did not apply. Sorry, but that's the best video I could find. Apparently fixing America's budget deficits wasn't important enough to land on the In Memoriam compilation. In this new PAYGO legislation, it was agreed that any tax cut or increase in government spending had to be offset by a spending cut or a tax increase to pay for it. Sounds about as controversial as saying vegetables are good for you. Now of course there were emergency exceptions and a rule that says bills don't require PAYGO if they can get 60% of senators on board and a majority in the house. And spoiler alert, keep that 60% number in your head because it comes up a lot later. But the majority of the time back then, you had to keep a balanced budget. Unfortunately, when this was passed, people were more concerned with, well, Bush famously said, Read my lips. No new taxes. But they should have read his legislation instead. Because, oh boy, there were a ton of new taxes. Solidifying that the next time PAYGO would come to the nation's attention, it would be in a slightly different context. Bill Clinton, whose administration voted to extend the bill in 1993, and then gave this speech that would have had Paul Ryan writing love sonnets soon afterward. First, the largest deficit reduction in history, nearly $500 billion with more spending cuts than tax increases. Now you might already be thinking, whoa, that guy's a Democrat? But it gets even better with him bragging about things that you would kind of tuck away in a government folder if you were a modern day politician. And it reduces government spending by more than $250 billion. We cut more than 100,000 positions from the federal payroll by attrition. We freeze discretionary spending for five years. We limit pay increases for federal employees. Woohoo! Wow, that chapter did not show up in my history book. Yeah, he had to make some pretty comprehensive cuts, and oddly enough, he was super open about it. I can't overemphasize that these cuts were brutal. According to a New York Times article from the time, we're going to save money by kicking people off of Medicaid, which sounds familiar, phasing out wastewater treatment grants, eh, forget about that, the ocean's large, and of course, the kicker, the one you would not get to touch nowadays. A cut to military spending of $60 billion by paring down 200,000 troops and cutting funding for, and yes, this is real, our Star Wars missile defense program. Eh, it was before Disney owned them, so the license was probably pretty cheap. I'm just saying this because we remember the surplus and not really how we got there. Further cuts came with the Balanced Budget Act of 1997 under Clinton, which cut out $112 billion from Medicaid, and an additional $44 billion in hospital inpatient and outpatient payments from the government. And again, you're telling me this guy was a Democrat? 
With liberals like these, who needs Republicans? Of course, all of these have to come to an end, and in 1998, with a surplus, the government started finding ways to spend more money. The real nail in the coffin was 2001, when President Bush decided to spend more money on helping the poor. I'm just kidding. Tax relief is the first achievement produced by the new tone in Washington, and it was produced in record time. Yeah, he did massive tax cuts that weren't met by massive spending cuts. This was because of the 60% Senate majority exception I mentioned earlier. It wasn't a big deal at the time though. We had a surplus, no expensive foreign wars, and we were the ones interfering in Russia's elections. Ah, <sighs> good times. In 2002, Pago was allowed to expire, and the rest is history. That is, until 2010 when Obama officially brought back Pago as federal law. In 2011, John Boehner made even stricter laws to govern the House of Representatives, specifically Cutco, which was essentially Paygo down to the super catchy word structure. But with Cutco, tax hikes could not be a part of the solution. Of course, since this was just something that governed the House rather than federal law, it took solutions off the table for House budget reconciliation exclusively. Looking at the numbers, it clearly didn't work. But why not? The main reason is emergency spending. Turns out that a lot of things are emergencies, most notably. I believe in pay go. If I want to spend something, I got to cut something or figure out a way to pay for it. This started right. under George Bush, paying for the Iraq war through an emergency supplemental. Yeah, that turned into a decades long emergency. We also use this to pay for our economic stimulus packages and all sorts of smaller ticket items with sections stating that the law is designated as an emergency for the purposes of pay as you go principles. According to PolitiFact, a large portion of this deficit so far has come from emergency spending. So although lawmakers have technically abided by PAYGO, the law exempts trillions of dollars. Sir, we're having a deficit crisis. Well, if you call it a deficit emergency, we can borrow billions to solve it. There's also the issue of a 60 vote Senate majority waiving PAYGO, although that is usually used for unbalanced tax cuts and some recovery programs that probably would have been emergencies if they didn't have the 60 votes. That might make this sound ineffective, but when this rule bites, it bites hard giving America one-two punches from whatever party's trying to pass legislation. Take for example the Affordable Care Act. This morning a new analysis from the Congressional Budget Office concludes that the reform we seek would bring 1.3 trillion dollars in deficit reduction over the next two decades. That makes this legislation the most significant effort to reduce deficits since the Balanced Budget Act in the 1990s. Now I could go into detail on that, but I would be about 8 years too late. Just know that both sides recognize that, with associated tax hikes and restructuring of Medicare, the Congressional Budget Office has pegged this as a profitable piece of legislation, which made it pay go neutral. That's the one two progressive punch of expanding health insurance and raising taxes. On the other hand, Republicans have had to make compromises with pay go too. You remember the Tax Cut and Jobs Act from last year? Good afternoon. We're coming on the air right now because President Trump about to appear on the South Lawn of the White House. You see it right there, surrounded by Republican members of Congress to celebrate the passage of their massive $1.5 trillion tax plan, the largest overhaul in a generation. $1.5 trillion added to the deficit? Well, Pago was its name -o. Or at least it would have been if it weren't for some quick thinking lawmakers. With the lack of other legislation, this would have triggered across the board cuts of over a trillion dollars to federal programs, because the tax cut had no way of paying for itself. But there was a plan. Specifically tell Democrats that these cuts are mostly going to come from Medicare if Democrats don't vote for a pay-go waiver, which is exactly what happened, getting 63% of votes in the Senate and a majority of votes in the House. So why are we talking about any of this today? As we mentioned at the top of the episode, included in the rules package which Pelosi hopes to pass today is a provision for pay go, pay as you go. 
That requires the House to offset any spending to avoid increases, increasing the budget deficit. Democrats aren't adding PAYGO to the House regulations. They're relaxing the John Boehner imposed CUTGO, which says you have to balance the budget for anything you pass. Oh yeah, and you can't use tax hikes to pay for it because I don't like them. To PAYGO, which has been federal law since 2010. If you're viewing this from a solving budget problems angle, it's kinda like reducing your carbon footprint by switching from driving a Panzer tank to a more fuel efficient Hummer limo. Now, some liberals are concerned that they won't be able to pass expensive items like a Green New Deal and a Medicaid for All bill through the system where you have to deduct costs from elsewhere. Instead, the more progressive left, led by people like Ocasio-Cortez, is proposing that the House abandon CutGo and instead go with unregulated spending. But the more conservative liberals seem to think arguing over this feels kinda like arguing over the gun control debate by focusing on Nerf guns. If you think that's at all an exaggeration, the Democratic Party old guard that supports PAYGO really hasn't bothered arguing for the rule on its merits. Instead, they argue it doesn't matter since the Senate still has its own pay-go rule. Oof, that reminds me of... I think we need someone that has the best in ethical standards as our next president. That's how I feel. Secretary Clinton, do you want to respond? No. Governor... Governor... <laughs> So one side, led by Ocasio-Cortez, is saying that this is going to tie progressives hands because we'll have regulation on spending. So we're not voting for your House of Representatives charter. And the other side is saying, trust us, this really doesn't matter because the Senate still has to balance the budget. The question is whether we're part of that conversation or not. So if nothing really matters and our Speaker of the House is just a complete nihilist, why fight to keep PAYGO in our charter? Well, in this next part, we'll have liberals saying, thanks Obama, because the 2010 PAYGO federal law that was passed, and mind you, we're not talking about the PAYGO rules that have been adopted by the House and Senate, we're talking about federal law, says that if the Office of Management and Budget detects a deficit in the congressional budget that's gone unaddressed, well, you're not going to have a good time. It triggers something called a sequester. In Washington, there were alarming predictions about what will happen to all of us and American life one week from tonight if those mandatory budget cuts crash down, $85 billion by law. This will shift responsibility for balancing the budget from the Democrat-controlled House compromising with the Republican-controlled Senate to our Office of Management and Budget Director. And man who you know gave himself that nickname, Mick the Knife Mulvaney. He's called the knife because he loves to cut social programs, and he's probably praying to every god he can name for a sequester. The point is, if Democrats participate in the PAYGO system, they'd be able to shift the conversation towards raising taxes and cuts to military spending to balance the budget. But if the House doesn't participate in the conversation, it's going to shift towards the Office of Management and Budget, who's probably going to take most of it out of Medicare programs. Not participating in PAYGO would kind of be like not voting for a candidate because neither candidate is progressive enough for you. We'll definitely hear you loud and clear, but your ideas just won't have a semblance of representation at the negotiating table. To avoid this, you're going to have to repeal the Obama-based law that I talked about earlier, PL111139. By getting the House and Senate majority to vote for repeal and having the president not veto that. Pelosi is allowing the more progressive elements of her party to introduce legislation to abolish spending regulation, and good luck with that. But overall, most people think that the House will vote in Pelosi's rules that include PAYGO regulation, because they think that the House of Representatives should be well represented when it comes to a conversation on which programs to cut. Thank you, and that's all I have to say about that. Hey YouTube, when I started researching this, I definitely expected this video to be more about the merits of debt rather than the legal implications of PAYGO. If you want to learn about government debt, this video goes into detail on its pros and cons. Overall, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you want to support independent, nonpartisan comedy news, remember to subscribe by clicking on this floating logo to the right of my head. Ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring and give me a like if you like what you saw. Lastly, as always, thank you for watching.